To debate this deepening currency conundrum, I'm joined by Stephen Gallo, Head of Market Analysis at Schneider Foreign Exchange, and Lauren Rosborough, Senior Currency Strategist at Westpac. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to, to get uh, you know, a quick feeling, because if you look at the agenda of what we're expecting in Washington, it seems that we've gone right back to the point where we were two years ago. I mean, they were always talking about currency imbalances and about global imbalances. So can we take respite in the fact that, it, well, at least they're not talking about a, you know, a double-dip recession, Lauren? Well, one thing that you know, typically is the case is the IMF meetings, um, G7, G20, is typically about economics. And unfortunately, it seems to be more about politics this time. And in particular, about the midterm US elections and their ability, I guess, using the scapegoat of um, China uh, in order to use the yuan as an excuse uh, to try and depreciate their currency. I think uh, the, the, the meetings this week um, will be largely framed on framed around what Trichet touched upon yesterday. And I think the bottom line is, is that global imbalances, the tensions globally between East and West have finally come to a head. I think policymakers are aware of the fact that if these imbalances are allowed to perpetuate, we will never be able to break away from the cycle of boom bust, of bubble and bust. Uh, and this is specifically what Trisha was referring to yesterday. The next stage in the game is for a revaluation of Asian currencies to happen vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. This is the only way that the U.S. can reflate itself. This is the only way that we can get away from this recycling of surpluses uh, into, into dollars and ultimately into financial assets in the Western world. It's quite interesting that uh, Trisha said yesterday that you know, it's in the U.S.'s interest to have a strong dollar. Now, that's very central bank speak. What it effectively means is if, it, if there is a strong U.S. economy, then a strong dollar will ensue. Now, we all know the U.S. economy at the moment isn't in a particularly strong place. Moreover, the yuan is actually appreciated against the U.S. dollar to the disadvantage of, say, Europe, for example. So it's very difficult for them to get that message across when they're in a relatively weak position themselves. Now, Steve, it, it was very interesting by you know, reading your notes that you really believe that there was a change in rhetoric in what Mr. Trichet I think, said yesterday. I think for a cool-headed central banker like Trisha, I think he was relatively aggressive. You notice that he didn't just say foreign exchange rates or currency rates need to reflect fundamentals. He said now more than ever foreign exchange rates need to reflect fundamentals. And that was a direct lie. He's, ch he's staring China right in the face. And he's saying you need to make the next move. You need to allow a revaluation of your currency. Asian economies that in the region that are underneath China, so to speak, will not make any moves. They will not lose competitiveness uh, via Western trade channels to China by moving their currencies first. China has to make the first move. Otherwise, we'll perpetuate the cycle. We'll never end this cycle of boom bust uh, and bubble mentality. Right, they've started to do a little bit of moves. I mean, we saw it a couple of months ago. It was the first time in years, if not decades, that China seemed to be amenable to, to actually do something. I mean, China's been trying to placate the U.S. The difficulty is, exactly as Stephen said, is that Europe is the one that's losing out on this. Yeah, in fact, I the stock is right. as well. I think Lauren is right. They're caught in between, you know, what's going on between the dollar and the yuan. And I mean, the, the, the euro has appreciated so strongly against the dollar and also against the yuan. And other than the stock it's been, in fact, even out of emerging market currencies, it's been the worst performer. It's, it, is, it is going to have an impact. And we saw the German export numbers today, and that's going to continue into the oh, end of the we're year. We're talking also in general about a currency war and we're going to see a lot of uh, you know other countries in Southeast Asia trying to depreciate th their currency does that give ammunition to China and saying well guys you know everyone else is doing it I think I think I think ultimately the the mood is so tense globally right now I mean I, I this is the closest we have been to the competitive devaluations that we saw in that period of interwar uh, instability between World War one and World War two this is the closest we've been it's not as explicit as it was then but the tensions are mounting it's all up to China everything is in China's hands um, they have to step up to the plate and they have to show the global economy that they're ready to take responsible decisions if they want to be a key player and be recognized on the world stage. Now, I want to move it along to the U.S. jobs data, but first, Lauren, give me an, an idea of actually, as a currency strategy, what would you be buying right now with all of these uncertainties ahead of the U.S. jobs data, but also ahead of this IMF meeting in Washington? Well, the jobs data is going to be quite key today for the dollar move. Uh, currencies that we continue to like, Aussie dollar can't get away from it. In fact, does, even though we've been at new highs yesterday, 
today. Still can't get away from the fact it looks like it's going through parity to you know, 105, 110 quite easily. And Steve, you say that actually yesterday we're looking at the US jobs data, mm -hmm. but it depends on when quantitative easing w will be put That's in place. That's right. My view about today is I think it's a difficult one to judge the outcome of the report and the impact that it will have on the US dollar. But I think unless the report is exceptionally good and it sort of gives the market an idea that QE2 might not be an inevitability, the Jobs report today will tell the markets more about the timing of QE2. So that is, if the, mar if, the, if, the, if the market sees a tepid report, it may mean we can wait until after November before QE2 arrives. If the report is exceptionally bad, it will certainly, you know, uh, there will be some urgency at the Fed to deliver a package relatively soon. And that is exactly the case. Because the jobs data is one of the mandates that the Fed has, they will be looking very closely at it. And the market has already preempted QE2, as it were, and now they're looking for reasons for that to occur. Absolutely right. Guys, thank you so much.